G facility. Minister. I, I can confirm I've been involved in no discussions regarding those matters. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Minister. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's economy. Members who wish to speak in the debate are invited to press the request button now. And I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to move the motion. Ms Bailey, 14 minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's been a mere two weeks since we last debated supporting Scotland's economy. Both debates brought forward by Scottish Labour and not the SNP. In that time, we have reflected on the publication of the government's annual accounts for 2013-14 and not one, but two papers on the benefits of improved economic performance emanating from the Scottish Government. And then, of course, last week, we had the UK budget. All provide us with insights as to the choices that voters face in the upcoming general election. And I want to take each of these in turn and let me start with the Conservative Lib Dem coalition's record in government. Because in the past five years, we have seen four out of five new jobs created in Scotland on low pay with 84,000 workers trapped in zero hours contracts. Energy bills have increased by over £300 under David Cameron, whilst the number of families with children who can't afford to heat their homes has risen to an all-time high. The average Scottish worker's annual wage has fallen by almost £1,600 in real terms since 2010. And the Tories, unsurprisingly, have cut taxes for millionaires and raised VAT to 20%, a regressive tax that hits the hardest pressed families the most. And thanks to the, in a second, thanks to the Tories, oh, they're both popping up. Thanks to the Tories and the Lib, Dem, Lib Dems, we've had 24 tax rises, which have left families £1,127 per year worse off. I'll take an intervention from one of the colleagues. I'm grateful to Jackie Bailey for giving way. If the position is as dismal as she paints, why do 40% of the population prefer George Osborne as Chancellor to only 21% thinking Ed Balls would do a better job? Really? I have to say there's no accounting for taste because I disagree with the, the, the number that would prefer George Osborne. And unsurprisingly, because under George Osborne's watch, tax avoidance now costs us £34 billion. We also see over 22,000 children in Scotland relying on food banks last year. I don't know what the members are laugh laughing about. I think that's pretty serious. Because in 2011, there was one Trussell Trust food bank in Scotland. Now there are 48. Taken together, I think this is a damning indictment of five years of Tory misrule. And just yesterday, the Scottish Government published an analysis of inequality in our country. And it told us the stark reality of Scotland today. The wealthiest 10% of households owning 44% of all of the wealth. In contrast, the least wealthy half of households in Scotland owned just 9% of total wealth. So under the Tories, there's no doubt about it, presiding officer, the rich are getting richer and the poor are even worse off than they were before. Inequality is increasing, that's not good for the economy, and it's not good for the country. These figures show that we simply cannot afford another five years of failed Tory austerity so that those at the top continue to thrive whilst working families across Scotland struggle to make ends meet. That's simply not fair, and only Labour is in a position to end Tory austerity. But what about the Tories' attempts to reduce the deficit? Well, on the basis that Mark Macdonald has an injured leg, please let me give way to Mark Macdonald. I, I am grateful to the member for her sympathy. I, I note the member saying that only Labour offers an alternative, but given that the Shadow Chancellor stated the day after the budget that he would reverse absolutely nothing from George Osborne's budget, in what way is the Labour Party offering any sort of alternative to the austerity being proposed by Jackie the Tories? Bailey. There is a, a significant alternative. Labour have never supported Tory austerity plans. The budget coming forward from the Tories is so insignificant it doesn't begin to address the problems we have. But the Tories have said that they would reduce the deficit. But even in that, they have quite simply failed to do so. In 2010, the Tories said they would balance the books by 2015. They would raise living standards for all. Well, living standards have fallen. Real wages are down. Prices are up. We are facing a significant 
cost of living crisis. The Institute of Fiscal Studies have confirmed that living standards are lower now than when the Tories came into office. And as for balancing the books, the Tory Lib Dem government is set to borrow over £200 billion more than they planned in 2010. So the Tory budget last week, very quickly. Well, really? She's forgotten one very important fact is that it her government that left us in this mess in the first place that we had to clear up. She's also forgotten that we've created 187,000 extra jobs. Is she going to answer that? Can I, you, can I simply say, you know, it, it ill behoves a Liberal Democrat to talk about budgets, particularly when they promised going into an election to scrap tuition fees, and the minute they were in power, they changed their minds. The Tory budget last week did very little to redistribute wealth in this country or to improve the lot of hard-working people and families. Perhaps most significant was what they didn't say. Barely a mention of public services like our NHS or our schools. Not a word on the cuts to come. And yes, there are cuts to come. Deeper and more significant in the next two years than anything we've seen in the previous five. That's what the Independent Office of Budget Responsibility told us. Tory spending plans will mean £70 billion of cuts to public spending if the Tories win the election. More than double, more than double the amount admitted to by David Cameron and George Osborne. That would mean a real terms cut of £2.7 billion a year to spending in Scotland by the end of the next Parliament. So we know that continuing Tory austerity undermines our NHS. We know that Tory austerity denies opportunities for our young people. It denies security in old age. To end Tory austerity, we need to get rid of the Tories at the election or we will have another five years of the deepest, most savage cuts to our public services, the likes of which have not been seen since the 1930s, a time before we created the NHS and when kids left school at age 14. Labour have a better plan. Our values and our vision is of an economy that works for all, a politics where everyone's voice is heard and a society based on the common good. A Labour government will raise the minimum wage to £8 an hour. We will ban exploitative zero-hours contracts. We will freeze energy bills so they can only fall, not rise. And we will have fairer taxes in place of the regressive taxation of the Tories. A Labour government will increase the taxes of the wealthiest few to give working-class Scots a better shot at life. We will use the mansion tax on homes worth £2 million to fund 1,000 more nurses in Scotland's NHS. And we will increase the top rate of tax to 50 pence to invest in the next generation. Presiding officer, no, I've taken lots of interventions already. Presiding officer, we will end tax avoidance by the hedge funds and the tax havens and an end to big companies doing sweetheart deals with HMRC. The Tories won't support this because they oppose the redistribution of wealth and Alex Salmond himself told us at the weekend that he agrees with the Tories. So there we have it. The SNP will oppose tax rises even on the wealthiest few, so much for progressive politics from the SNP. So let's examine what the SNP promise. They offer full fiscal autonomy, where Scotland raises all of its own taxes for all of its own spending. That means scrapping the Barnet formula that protects Scotland's public services like our NHS and our schools. A fortnight ago, we knew that full fiscal autonomy would cost Scotland over £6 billion less for public spending in 2014-15. That was based on what we knew about the structural gap as well as the falling oil price. Since the UK budget, and the revised OBR projections, we now know that the situation is even worse. The Independent Institute of Fiscal Studies tell us that the cost of full fiscal autonomy, the SNP's policy, now is a staggering 7.6 billion black hole at the heart of the Scottish budget each and every year. That's a bombshell of £1,400 for every single person in Scotland. Now, we would e either need to have huge cuts to services or we would need to raise taxes by this amount. It is simply staggering. Scrapping Barnet, as the SNP want to do, would mean cutting our NHS in half, 
scrapping every single school in the country and cancelling the state pension in Scotland. It would have devastating consequences for all of us. Last week, we estimated that Scotland would lose at least 138,000 jobs based on a £6 billion black hole. That's a loss of one in every 16 Scottish jobs. With a £7.6 billion pound black hole, that number just got bigger. What the SNP promise isn't just Tory austerity. With the SNP, it's austerity on steroids. It is completely bizarre policy that would cost us all very dearly. And with the cuts... With the SNP's austerity max, these aren't just a risk, presiding officer. They would be a certainty. No thank you. As Peter Jones put it in yesterday's Scotsman, dump fiscal autonomy, it's insanity. And it's not just Peter Jones saying that, presiding officer. The SDUC have strongly voiced their opposition, as have a number of leading economists and impartial experts who warned of the consequences for our public services. The presiding officer, we were also treated to the First Minister's plan to reduce the deficit and increase spending. She promised £180 billion of investment across the UK and debt reduction in every single year. The truth is, they got that wrong and debt would increase. The Deputy First Minister read out the figures for us all to know the truth of that. But they had to revise their figures to show a decrease in investment so that debt would reduce. Yet even, even though they had been caught out, they return to using the original figures that are simply not true. You just cannot believe a word that we are told by the SNP finance minister. But of course, presiding officer, the SNP tell us that we can grow our way out of the problem. In their two papers on the benefits of improved economic performance, they point to increases in factor productivity, investments, exports up by 50%. The economics are absolutely fascinating. The assumptions are frankly heroic. Two papers in a matter of six days and suddenly we've added £700 million to the bottom line. The fact is that this analysis is not rooted in reality. But, you know, even allowing for the SNP's figures, which are contested, there still remains a huge gap in the nation's finances. Using the SNP's best figures, we would see an additional £17 billion in 10 years. Now, that sounds a lot, presiding officer, but with Barnett, we would see an extra £76 billion over 10 years. So where would the difference come from? The truth is that it would come from all of us in tax rises or deep and catastrophic cuts to services. It also means that there is absolutely no possibility of Scottish public finances being in any fit state to ease austerity under full fiscal autonomy, there could only ever be harsher and longer-lasting austerity. As I said two weeks ago, no amount of name-changing will help the SNP. Full fiscal autonomy became full revenue retention, but the policy itself remains entirely wrong-headed. And the modelling is suspect too. Do the assumptions include the block grant? And I look forward to hearing the Finance Secretary about that. Do the assumptions include Barnett? Because John Swinney knows you cannot have both and there is dishonesty in the modelling. It is truly astonishing, presiding officer, that John Swinney backs a policy of full fiscal autonomy that he knows is madness, that he knows lacks credibility and that he knows will hurt this country deeply. <laughs> Much of Labour's policy officer in recent weeks has come about because of the Barnett bonus. We would use the proceeds from the mansion tax to invest in our NHS and invest in 1,000 extra nurses. We would use the money from pension tax relief to deliver a better future for 18 and 19 year olds, keep tuition fees free and improve bursaries for the least well-off students. We would back the living wage, making employment fairer, something the SNP voted against five times in this chamber. And we would make sure that Scottish people succeed because we know that when Scottish people prosper, Scotland prospers too. None of that would happen with the SNP's policy of full fiscal autonomy and none of that would happen under the Tories' austerity plans. 
Scottish Labour has a better plan, presiding officer. Our value and vision is for a better future. So let's go out and change Scotland, Most because close, this please. is not a time to gamble with the SNP. Let's make sure we end Tory austerity and kick the Tories out of government. Move your motion, please. Would you like to move your motion? And I move the motion in my Many name. Many thanks. Desperately short of time today, I now call on John Swinney. Speak to and move Amendment 12776.4. A Deputy First Minister, up to 10 minutes, please. Uh, President, so let me begin by moving the amendment that stands in my name. Uh, I thought when Jackie Bailey started out her speech today that uh, on such a landmark occasion where the Labour Party had decided to have a debate about Scotland's economy, that we were going to have a comprehensive explanation of the alternative strategy of the Labour Party to uh, advance the issues about which the Labour Party is concerned. And, I think we got about 90 seconds out of 14 minutes, which was about the Labour Party's plans. And the other period was just the usual bile from Jackie Bailey dished out to absolutely everybody on the critique of the Labour Party. But let me try... So I, I'm, going to try, I'm going to try to be as helpful as I can to find common ground with Jackie Bailey in this debate. Because the one thing that I can agree with Jackie Bailey about is that the United Kingdom's austerity programme has failed by any standard. Um, it's delayed the UK's economic recovery. It's done little to achieve the Chancellor's original deficit targets. And it's disproportionately hit the poorest in our society. And members uh, criticise me. I can hear muttering on this side of the chamber about that. Let me just share some of those issues that you know, the Conservatives are aware of the fact that in June 2010 the Chancellor predicted that the UK would run a surplus on the structural, on the structural current budget of £5 billion in this financial year and uh, he now expects to run a, a structural current deficit of over £45 billion this year and that's a, a clear, that, that, that is the evidence that demonstrates that the public finances have not recovered in the fashion that the Chancellor predicted in June 2010, of course. Mr Fraser. Would, would Mr Swinney not give the Chancellor some credit for having created a situation where we have in the United Kingdom the fastest growing economy in the Western world? The, John the, Swinney. The, 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 thing about that, uh, the thing about that analysis, the thing about that, that analysis is that we have to look at all of the years that were involved in the Chancellor's term in office. And back in 2010, the Chancellor predicted that the type of economic conditions we are experiencing now today, which are welcome, and let me put that on the record, we should have been ap appreciating those conditions and experiencing those conditions in 2012 and 2013. And we were experiencing nothing of the sort. We were experiencing the implications, which I set out to Parliament would be the case, of the, of the severe cuts that were made in 2010, which interrupted the first signs of economic recovery that were taking place when the Conservatives came to office. And as a consequence, the Chancellor has failed to meet his economic targets at uh, the moment that he said the structural current budget should be at a £5 billion surplus today. And if that... Uh, of course. Gavin Brown. To, to follow up on the murder of Fraser's point then, why then, in the Deputy First Minister's view, is growth in the UK projected to be better than almost all of the Eurozone countries? And why is employment predicted to be higher than almost all of those countries? John Swinney. Well, well, what, the, the issue that Mr Brown, it's, it's the same answer that I gave to, to Mr Fraser, that we had two years where the Chancellor predicted we should have been experiencing faster growth, which we experienced nothing of the sort, and we are now beginning to see the emergence of that growth. So if we put the, the pattern of economic growth that we're experiencing now against the period that the Chancellor predicted, we will find that the Chancellor's uh, predictions about 2012 and 2013 were utterly flawed. Now, last week the Chancellor had every opportunity to change course in his economic direction. Uh, however, despite the headroom generated by the improvements in the economic outlook that I've just acknowledged, he chose to continue with the harmful austerity agenda. We were told last week that austerity would end one year earlier and that planned spending cuts had been scaled back. But the, ra the reality is that the day before the budget, George Osborne planned £30 billion worth of cuts. 
and the day after the budget, he still planned to have £30 billion worth of cuts. So those are the, 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 the damaging implications of the, uh, the stewardship of the United Kingdom public finances, courtesy of George Osborne. Uh, of course. Rennie. I hear what he says, but why does he think that the answer to record high levels of debt is even more debt? John Swinney. I'll, I'll come on to address that issue in, in a moment. I plan to come on to those questions in, in, in a later part of my speech. So, having seen that critique of austerity, what was more remarkable for me about the, not so much the Chancellor's inflexibility last week, um, was what was more remarkable was the fact that Labour's shadow Chancellor, Ed Balls, explicitly approved of the Chancellor's approach and said he would not reverse any of the budget measures. And Labour has embraced the Chancellor's austerity agenda by signing up to the UK government's fiscal mandate. As the Chancellor confirmed in his speech last week, meeting the fiscal target would require £30 billion worth of spending cuts over 2016-17 and 2017-18. And if Labour members are unsure about what their position is, let me just tell them that the Charter for budget, of Budget Responsibility, for which they voted on the 13th, or their colleagues voted for, in the House of Commons on the 13th of January, it contained the implicit assumption that in order to meet the fiscal mandate and supplementary debt target set out in the updated charter, the government estimates that on current forecasts, around £30 billion of discretionary consolidation is likely to be required over the following two years, 2016-17 and 2017-18. So I think the Labour Party should be... Jackie Bailey, I'll, I'll give way in just a moment. Uh, Jackie Bailey has made her clarion call, as usual, for everybody to be honest and transparent. Jackie Bailey should be honest and transparent and accept that Labour are as wedded to austerity as are the Conservatives. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking an intervention? Um, perhaps he disagrees with the Resolution Foundation that suggested that Labour's plans for the next Parliament would see an extra £43 billion invested. Perhaps he disagrees with the Institute of Fiscal Studies that actually said there's not a huge amount of difference between Labour and the SNP's spending plans. So if you think we support austerity, then isn't it the case that you do too? I think I, all I ask Jackie Bailey, it's lovely to hear all these quotes, but I just want Jackie Bailey to explain to Parliament why the Labour Party voted in favour of the... We didn't, she said. Jackie Bailey's just said we didn't. Jackie Bailey doesn't obviously know what day of the week it is. Ja no, no, I've, I've given, I've given way. Well, well, okay, okay, okay. Well, Jackie have it. Yeah, come on. Voting to balance the books is entirely different to voting for a package of cuts. We reject Tory austerity. It's about time you did too. Well, well, well the, 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 the Labour Party voted for the Charter of Budget Responsibility which requires £30 billion of discretionary consolidation, which means cuts in plain language for Jackie Bailey. And, if, and then Jackie Bailey's just said, in, in her last intervention to me, she's just said the Labour Party doesn't support cuts. Well, maybe I now answer, uh, I'm able to follow her argument. Maybe she's persuaded by the line of argument which says that the approach should involve sensible reductions in public spending. Now, those aren't my words. Those are the words of the Labour motion that was put to the House of Commons on the 4th of March. And the last time I looked, sensible reductions in public expenditure mean cuts. So whichever way Jackie Bailey wants to have it, the Labour Party's wedded to austerity and cuts just as much as the Conservative Party are in this whole debate. Now, I was rather surprised in the argument that Jackie Bailey advanced in criticising the fiscal approach advanced by the First Minister. And her argument was that somehow to invest in the economy, which is what we want to see happening, is somehow a bad thing. I, and this is my point to Mr Rennie. I believe there is a moment in economic recovery where you have to invest to support and to encourage and to nurture growth. And the proposals that we've set out are designed to do that, to invest in the economy, to create the, the climate where we can undertake greater levels of economic activity, which will encourage and motivate greater participation in the economy, which will ensure we have more taxpayers, and as a consequence, the public finances become stronger as a consequence. So that is the, the thinking behind our stance. I would have thought that was a stance that might have attracted support from the Labour Party, but who knows 
the result of the election might do so. I'll give in, in the Wayne. last minute, Mr. Yep. Swinney, you're not sure. taking this intervention. Well, I'm not. Oh, sorry. I'll, uh, well, <laughs> well, there, Mr. There Swinney. Thank, th 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 thank goodness. Thank goodness somebody's here to overrule me, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, let, me, let me conclude my remarks, Presiding Officer, by, by saying to, to Parliament, the Scottish Government is committed to taking forward a programme of investment within the economy. We believe the United Kingdom uh, Government should change its fiscal stance to enable us to do that more effectively within Scotland by enabling us to have the resources to invest in securing economic recovery and economic development in Scotland. Um, we want to do that. Uh, we want to be able to do that by the, the, by the power and the effectiveness of a strong group of SNP MPs in the Westminster Parliament after the election, and I look forward to seeing that being the result on the 8th of May. Yeah, Thanks yeah. so much. And I now call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move Amendment 12776.3. Mr Brown, up to six minutes, please. Presenting officer, thank you. Can I start by moving uh, the amendment in, by name, in my name and by saying I actually commend the... Labour Party for bringing the economy to debate today. To borrow the language of Sir Humphrey, I think it was courageous of the Labour Party to wish to debate the economy in a way that they don't want to do at a UK level. But to be fair to Scottish Labour, it is the third time they've wished to debate the economy and fair play to them. They haven't got much better uh, by the third time, I have to say. And I'm no clearer, I have to say, on what the Labour alternative plan actually is, but perhaps in closing today, a rabbit or two will be pulled out of the Labour Party hat and we'll hear what it is they actually intend to do. Because ultimately the economy makes uncomfortable reading for both the Labour Party and the SNP, because they were loud in their chorus several years ago saying that the plan wouldn't work. What we were doing was not going to be effective at all, and what we were going to see was a deeper recession. We're actually going to see a double dip recession, I think was the uh, uh, prediction uh, of the Scottish Triple. Government. And actually, that didn't happen. Deputy Presiding Officer, we saw the headline rates for the economy last week in the budget, and they were all moving in the right direction. They were all positive, and they were all projected to get better and stronger for each year of the forecast period. And to counter Mr Swinney's point, when you compare the projections for the UK to our trading partners, to the rest of the EU, we feature very, very well. If you take growth as an example, in 2014, we had the highest growth in the G7. The growth projections for 2015 were revised upwards last week by the Office for Budget Responsibility. Projections for world growth were revised downwards by the OBR, yet the UK was revised upwards. And EU growth, Eurozone growth, will be lucky if it hits 1% in 2015. I'll, I'll give way to the, the Cabinet Secretary first. John Swinney. I'm grateful to Mr Brown, but does he not acknowledge the strength of my point by the fact that GDP per capita remains, at the end of 2014, nearly 2% 2 below pre-recession levels? So the projected growth that the Chancellor expected to have has not materialised as a consequence of the decision. The presiding officer, the projections of 2010 did not materialise in the way that the Chancellor predicted. But what the Chancellor and nobody else knew was that the entire continent of Europe went on the precipice a year later. Of course, growth was delayed by two years because you had six quarters of negative growth across Europe, with whom we do almost half of our trade. And if the Scottish Government's finance minister cares to read the reports of his own chief economist, yep. that impact is acknowledged in almost every one of those reports which I have read. So, of course, that was going to have an impact. And that would have had an impact whether we'd gone with Labour spending plans, whether we'd gone with SNP spending plans, or whether we had been independent. The Eurozone crisis would have affected this economy regardless of the spending plans laid out. Now, the uh, Deputy First Minister is generous in giving way, and so I'll, I'll give way again to him. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Brown. Does that not then make the case that we made repeatedly to the United Kingdom Government for an early change to the austerity agenda to invest in the economy? Jim Brown? No, 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 it doesn't, Deputy Presiding Officer, because when taking the difficult decisions as we did and when we did, we now find ourselves in a far better position Sorry. than our European neighbours. Growth is to projected to be two and a half times most of our competitors. 
We have the highest employment rate we have ever had in this country. Unemployment is too high still, but at just over 5.5%, it compares very favourably to double-digit unemployment in France and Italy and many other European countries. So his arguments would be fine if we were on the same page as the rest of Europe, if we were all doing well at the same time. But he has to accept and acknowledge that the UK government action has achieved something positive if we are doing well, projected to do better, when with those countries with whom we compete are not projected to do the same. Now, I've taken a number of interventions, so I hope Mr Robertson will forgive me for not uh, doing so. Deputy Presiding Officer, this has not happened by accident. It's happened because of the difficult decision taken early. It's happened because the UK government stuck to the path. And it's happened because UK businesses and the people of this country stood firm, stepped up to the plate and created jobs underpinned by the competitive policies of the UK government, whether that's corporation tax, freezing fuel duty, raising the personal allowance um, or cutting national insurance. But Deputy Presiding Officer, what really I have to say uh, great uh, in this side of the chamber is the SNP's assertion that somehow if we had fiscal autonomy, there wouldn't be austerity. Somehow we'd be able to get rid of austerity. That is blatantly untrue. And I know Mr Swinney knows this because he looks at all the figures and he does judiciously, I have to say, look at the numbers. He knows, based on the JERS figures from a couple of weeks ago, he knows, based on the figures we're likely to see in JERS next year, he knows, based on the likely oil revenues we'll see over the next five years or so, that actually, if we went for fiscal autonomy, there would have to be far far deeper Roger, austerity close, than we have under the UK government, whether it's Conservative or indeed Labour. But on that basis, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm content to close. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 12776.1. Mr Rennie, up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll do it exactly that. I'll move the amendment in my name. I'm grateful to the Labour Party for calling this debate because I think it gives us all in this chamber an opportunity to shine a light on the different economic plans of the various parties. For me, this debate should be about economic competence and fairness because you cannot have one without the other. And I think it's worth off by just reminding the chamber that this government said that Scotland would be on the verge of a second oil boom with blossoming oil fund, more jobs and ever increasing tax receipts. Now we face a low oil price worth half what they confidently predicted we would have. Jobs have been slashed and tax revenues have plummeted. In fact, it has been estimated that the shortfall on their predictions is worth £155 million every day. Now I think it's worth reflecting on this because this goes to the heart of the SNP's competence on managing the economy. They said that it would be far better off with this oil boom and the reality is something different. And the JERS figures show exactly that, worth about £800 for every single person in this country. That's the penalty that we would have paid for independence or full fiscal autonomy. So their central argument on the economy for independence has been found wanting. I'll take an intervention. In the point that Mr Rennie makes that uh, economic competence can be uh, determined as a result of predictions on oil price. At the time that the Scottish Government was predicting $110 per barrel, the UK Government, DEC, which uh, is led by his colleague Ed Davey, was predicting $120 billion a barrel. What does that say about the economic competence of the Liberal Democrats? He's not, Sorry, he's not comparing like like What it proves, actually, is you cannot run an economy simply on the big resource of oil. It's so volatile, it has a big impact, and therefore trying to have generous predictions on oil reveals how incompetent the SNP have been on the oil and on the economy. But despite the animosity that clearly exists between Jackie Bailey and John Swinney, and in fact the whole of the Labour Party and the SNP, there are many similarities between the two parties' plans. Members will have heard me before say that the Nationalists and Labour said that the UK economic plan would fail, unemployment would rise, GDP would stagnate, and employment would fall. But now, thanks to the plan from the UK Government, we now have falling unemployment, higher employment and growth is back. And despite these facts, the SNP and Labour continue to say the plan has failed. Yet according to the latest figures 
the latest figures shows that employment in Scotland is at a record high, up 187,000 since 2010. Growth is back, as Gavin Brown says, vying with the United States of America for the best in the G7 group of countries. So like Labour, the SNP said that the UK's economic plan would fail just before the economy started to grow again. And like Labour, the SNP argued for lighter regulation of the banks just before they went bust. And now, just like Labour, they think the answer to high levels of debt is ever more debt. The SNP and Labour were wrong on the banks, wrong on the economy, wrong on jobs, and now they have the audacity to say that's all in the past and that they are definitely right this time. They want to borrow billions of pounds more when we should be eliminating the deficit and cutting debt. Their plans will put the economy at risk and we should not put our faith in parties that have been consistently wrong on the economy. Now, even though we've worked quite constructively with the Conservatives over the last five years to get the economy back on track, we do part company with them on their plans for the next five years. They want to do two things. First, like us, they want to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, but they want to do so with no tax rises, whereas we are planning £6 billion worth of tax rises on banks and mansions. Unlike the Conservatives, we do not believe that public services can bear the full impact of those cuts. Secondly, once we have eliminated the deficit, we want to invest in capital works for the good of the country. The Tories disagree. And I have to say the Conservatives seem to be hell-bent on an ideological mission, not just now, to reduce the size of the state. I'll take them in a second. Reduce the size of the state, which will damage public services and take the UK back to the 1960s. I'll take an intervention. Does the Brown. member accept then that his party, though, doesn't want to eliminate the deficit, they just want a current budget balance? We, we, we agree with the Conservatives that we should eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. Um, that's the plan that we've got. That's the £30 billion reduction that we've got in place. And that's where we do agree with the Conservatives. What we disagree is with the mix of the spending that is required, spending and taxes that are required in order to achieve that. So we reject the volatile seesaw economics of the past, George with Labour and the SNP borrowing too much, risking the economy, and the Tories cutting too much, threatening public services. Look at the progress we've made. We've cut taxes by £900 for workers. We've increased pensions by £900. We've got the economy back on track. We've expanded childcare for families that need it most. That's the balance of doing the fairness in society together with getting the economy back on track. And that's why you should stick with the Lib Dems. Thank you very much. And I now call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move Amendment 12776.2. Mr Harvey, up to six minutes to, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I suppose... Uh, I should begin by acknowledging the point of agreement that I have with both, uh, both with the government and with the, the Labour Party in a rejection, basically, of the UK government's economic agenda, the austerity agenda. That's a point of, of common ground between all the political parties which are not part of the, the UK coalition uh, in this parliament, a rejection of that austerity agenda. I think, if I remember rightly, both Jackie Bailey and John Swinney described it as a failed agenda. And I think I would just take issue to a certain extent with that, because in my view, that agenda was not designed to serve the common good. From the Conservatives' point of view in particular, I believe that agenda was designed to entrench an ideology, to entrench an economic model which that political party is wedded to. And given the political situation they've engineered in which they see very little coherent opposition to the basic proposition of cuts coming from the main opposition party at Westminster, I think from their point of view, ideologically, they've succeeded, even if they haven't achieved uh, the benefit to the common good, which most of us, I think, would wish for. In fact, the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, said very clearly that Spending cuts on the scale implied by the Chancellor's plans would lead to a fundamental reimagining of the role of the state. 
I think that was their intention all along. I think that was their purpose. And I think on those terms, they had been catastrophically successful. Looking at the alternatives that are before us, we've got a, a debate between the Labour Party about uh, a slower pace of cuts, a slower pace uh, of uh, essentially the same broad policy, or from the SNP, uh, the uh, implication that a, uh, uh, an increased borrowing uh, level from the UK government compared to what's currently planned would allow some 180 billion extra of spending and investment uh, over the term of the coming parliament. Now, neither of these, uh, I think, can be seen as the only option. And the Green Amendment today is intended to at least begin some debate uh, on an additional alternative that exists before us. Because over the last few years, we have seen, and in Europe, we are still seeing, uh, an approach to quantitative easing, the creation of money, the quite legitimate, quite legitimate creation of money uh, through the use uh, of central banks. But that has been used, particularly in the UK's case, on the scale of £375 billion, it has been used principally to rebalance the balance sheets of the financial services sector. Now, whether you take the view that that's created a benefit for bankers, and whether we attach blame to the bankers as the great villains of the economic crash, it certainly hasn't invested in the real economy. It certainly hasn't sent £375 billion of investment into the real economy and into the priorities that I think would serve the common good. And this is the alternative which the Green New Deal group, including figures such as Richard Murphy, Colin Hines and my colleague Caroline Lucas, have been advocating at UK level more recently. And in fact, in an exchange of letters... Pardon me. In an exchange of letters between Caroline Lucas and Mark Carney, uh, Caroline argues that the Green New Deal Group's plan is designed fundamentally to transform a still broken financially, uh, financial system and reduce the deficit while transforming the UK's ageing infrastructure to meet a range of environmental and social challenges. These challenges, many of them, are those that we've all agreed to on paper, some of them unanimously agreed to, and yet we're not seeing the investment come uh, to meet those challenges. Now, some of us might have expected the Bank of England to take a slightly conservative uh, approach and perhaps dismiss this uh, green QE programme as something unachievable. But in fact, Mark Harney replied to say it is possible that if the MPC did vote to increase its asset purchases in future, in other words, another round of QE, it could expand the range of assets it purchased. In fact, the idea of a green QE programme is one which is very realistic indeed, and one that I hope is not completely out of kilter with some other political parties' priorities. Uh, in, in just the last week or so, David Blanchflower, for example, uh, has said the next move in interest rates either has to be more quantitative easing or a cut in interest rates or both. Now, if more quantitative easing is going to be even contemplated, if that's on the agenda at all, surely... Surely the opportunity is to inject that in real investment into the real economy and into the social, economic and environmental priorities that the country faces. Now, the, the SNP are knocking doors around the country with enthusiastic and optimistic faces about the influence they may have in a balanced parliament after May. Let me just say, whichever political parties in here have some balance to have some influence in a balanced parliament close, after please. May. Let's make sure that we use that influence for the right priorities, not for those Fergus Ewing might want by pushing the government to exempt coal uh, from carbon taxes or bail out outdated, redundant, polluting infrastructure. Let's invest instead in the new infrastructure, the new priorities that our country needs, Scotland and the UK need for the future. Far better Finally. this than inviting in private equity or overseas governments to build and own the country's infrastructure on our behalf. I move the amendment in my name and I do hope that the Scottish Government is open to this argument. Many thanks. We now move to open debate. Five minute speeches, extraordinarily tight for time. If we don't manage the timekeeping, we'll be making cuts of our own up here. So, Mark MacDonald to be followed by Alex Rowley. 
Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And on the basis that I can keep my balance for five minutes, that's how long I intend to take. Uh, two weeks ago, Presiding Officer, as has been highlighted, the Labour Party brought uh, this very debate to the Chamber. Uh, and sadly, I was not able to participate in the debate because on the Sunday previous, I had sustained an injury. And I was distraught, and I'm sure the Chamber were equally as distraught to miss out on my contribution. Luckily, they have brought this debate back just for me, just so that I can have the opportunity to speak on the issue of Scotland's economy. And while it may be that I have sustained a broken leg, it's clear that the Labour Party are still acting like a broken record because they continue <laughs> to go on and on and on, talking down the prospects of Scotland's economy and Scotland's economic future, trying to, per trying to perpetuate the myth that Scotland as a nation is uniquely incapable of sustaining, of growing and of performing well as an economy. And that does the Labour Party no service whatsoever, and I suspect it may be somewhat of a genesis of the reason why the Labour Party is performing quite so spectacularly badly in the opinion polling that we are seeing in Scotland at the moment. But let's look at the actual agenda that we're talking about and that we're putting forward at the moment in terms of the economy. Because what we have uh, chosen to focus on is on the opportunities that exist to uh, have modest growth in public spending at a UK level, which would then deliver direct benefits to Scotland, but also would have uh, other benefits to the wider UK in terms of addressing the continual cut in public expenditure that is taking place. And as we know from the analysis that has been undertaken by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, that would enable the uh, projections that the Labour Party themselves have established in terms of deficit reduction to still be achieved while operating within that financial envelope of increased public expenditure. I believe that is a win-win scenario because undoubtedly deficit reduction is something that needs to be tackled, but it does not need to be tackled in the manner that it is uh, given the priority ahead of everything else, which is the uh, unfortunate position that we find from the current UK government where the deficit is seen as the be-all and end-all and the uh, the, the poorest and most vulnerable in society are seen as an afterthought as a, de, uh, as a means to achieving those targets. Because we heard talk today, as we often hear from the Conservatives, about those difficult decisions that have to be made. Well, the decisions are not difficult for Conservative ministers because they don't tend to impact upon them. They're certainly not difficult for uh, many of the powerful corporate interests who are supportive of the Conservative Party and are quite friendly with some of the front benchers in the Conservative Party at Westminster because they don't directly impact on them. The people who are bearing the brunt of these difficult decisions are the poorest in society who are having to face on a regular basis an assault on uh, their incomes and an assault on their way of life from UK government decisions. And that is simply acknowledged by any analysis that is done of the impact of budget decisions in terms of economic deciles uh, in the UK. It is those at the lower end who are facing significant detriment, where those at the top end are not facing any form of significant detriment whatsoever. And what we can see from that only too clearly is if we look at where the focus is directed, if we look at the uh, focus in terms of effort, in terms of budget and in terms of rhetoric between welfare and um, uh, in particular uh, the, the concept of benefit fraud as it is often termed and tax avoidance. One, welfare fraud, uh, which uh, undoubtedly should be tackled. I'm not suggesting for one second it should not, but it accounts for less than £2 billion per annum. Less is lost to the Exchequer uh, in welfare fraud than they actually retain through the failure of individuals who are entitled to benefits to take up the benefits to which they are entitled. Final they minute. actually make a net saving in that area. But if we look at tax avoidance and tax evasion, which costs the Exchequer on an annual basis 30 to 35 billion pounds and then we look at the fact that there is a disproportionately higher number of staff allocated to, to tackling welfare fraud than there is to tackling tax evasion and tax avoidance I say we have a UK government that has got its priorities 100% askew in relation to that and it is uh, and if we look at the fact uh, the number of people who, can who are facing sanctions on their benefits, which is driving them into the need to uh, call upon assistance from food banks, and we have seen uh, in Aberdeen the instant neighbour food bank running out close, of supplies please. in recent days versus those who are being actively pursued and prosecuted for evasion of tax 
again we can see that the UK government has its priorities 100% askew. There is a better way to do things. We have outlined a better way to do things, and I hope in May we will have the opportunity to you get on close, with doing please. things differently. I'm afraid there is no time available. Alec Riley to be followed by John Mason. Presiding officer, whilst um, Gavin Brown and Willie Rennie pat each other on the back for where they are, it's worth remembering that in 2010, um, when, when they went into government, when the Tories and the support of the Liberals went into government, that we were coming out of a recession. The economy was growing from what was the first global banking crisis and a global recession, and we were coming out of it. And I would put to both, both parties that it was as a result of a direct result of the economic policies that were then pursued and the austerity measures that were pursued that we did not continue to grow and we did not continue to grow at the rate of what we should have done, and that is why we are not in a place now. And, and I have only got five minutes. Sorry. And the other key points I think it's worth making to the, the Tories in particular is that whilst employment is growing, you need to look at the types of jobs that are actually being created within the economy and the levels of unfairness, the levels of inequality in the economy are not being tackled. Um, low pay, zero, zero wage contracts, um, in effect most workers haven't, haven't had to take a five-year pay freeze, while energy prices prices continued to rise, while the cost of living continued to rise. So people were not actually at this stage in a really good place in terms of their budgets and how, how they move forward. And the other big problem with the Tory, Tory austerity is that it is an attack on the poor. It's not about saying we'll all take our share and we'll all have to suffer equally in terms of coming out of this. Um, the type of welfare reforms that we're seeing taking place, the, the sanctions and the kind of targets that are being put on sanctions is, for the first time um, probably since the 40s, is creating absolute poverty in communities across Scotland. So that is an absolute failure in economic policy, no matter how you measure it. Um, and that cannot be right and, and, and is not right. And, and, and Mark uh, McMillan mentioned the fact about rather than a war on, on the poor, let's go after the tax dodgers, the tax cheats, the tax evaders, and start to collect the billions upon billions upon billions of pounds um, that can be brought in to start to actually address the deficit. And, you know, the fact is the Tory Chancellor has not addressed the deficit. And we still have major problems in terms of the levels of debt in this country. And to be honest, we still have a major problem in terms of our economy, um, in terms of what it produces and the manufacturing base, which was destroyed by the 18 years that we had a Tory government previously. But I do, I do want in the short time that I've got, I do want to uh, come on to speak about um, the, 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 the policies in terms of what John Swinney and the Scottish Government are putting forward. And I don't think it is to, to um, attack with, with, with bile, if you like, that, that's been suggested when you question the impact that full fiscal autonomy would have on the Scottish economy in the short to medium term as you go forward. Because all the evidence suggests that, that, that I mean, the figure was being used um, and the figure that was given by the independent advice for the Scottish Parliament um, was that, that the Barnett formula um, would result at £6.5 billion that would have to be made up from some place with full fiscal autonomy. And I think it's a legitimate question to put to the Deputy First Minister is where would we make up that difference and how would we make up that difference? And I think if you have a genuine concern, as I do, that you know, that would either result in major cuts in public services or a need to increase taxes at a time where that would be damaging equally Final to the minute. economy, then it's legitimate to ask the question, would fiscal, full fiscal autonomy not result in deeper cuts um, and deeper job losses than what we've actually experienced. Um, so, so I think the, 
you know, the Deputy um, First Minister has to argue that. And my final point would be that even in terms of his amendment, where he talks about the economy performing and starting to tackle inequalities, I don't believe this government actually has a clear anti-poverty strategy. I've been looking and found that you had a framework to tackle poverty and income, income inequality in Scotland 2008. I'm told there's been some updates. I can't measure this to see where these outcomes have been achieved. If there is no clear anti-poverty strategy for Scotland, we're not going to start to tackle inequality to and poverty. So these are legitimate points that I think are raised with the government. I'm afraid you need to finish. Thank you. John Mason to be followed by Graham Pearson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I do think there's a number of issues in the Labour motion today which we need to look at in a bit more detail. Firstly, they suggest that full fiscal autonomy uh, would make Scotland £7.6 billion worse off. And uh, this is not the point and does not hold water for a number of reasons. Point one, it only looks at one year on its own and we need to take a long-term view. We need to remember the many, many years when Scotland has been subsidising the rest of the UK. Two weeks ago, we debated the economy, and I spoke about the failure of the UK over the long term, so I will not mention all of these points again today, but particular failures of the UK have included failure in manufacturing and failure to grow Scotland's population. Point two, no, I'm not taking any interventions. Point two, if we ask the public which party stands best for Scotland, the answer is always the SNP even amongst people who do not vote for us. Some politicians want what is best for the UK as a whole, even if Scotland suffers in the process, and they are entitled to do that if they are in the Labour, Conservative or Liberal Democrat parties. But that is not a position you will find in the SNP, so no one actually believes Labour's assertion when they talk nonsense such as they want the SNP to, uh, Scotland, SNP wants Scotland to lose out. Point three, as long as we stay in the UK, we want a better deal for Scotland. If there is to be a hung parliament in London after May, we want more powers, but we also want more money. For example, seeing high-speed rail brought to Scotland. Point four, we also have the policy clearly stated by Westminster that transfer of powers should be on a no-detriment principle. More powers for Scotland must not mean that Scotland or the UK is automatically better or worse off just because of the transfer of powers. So for all of these reasons, Labour's suggestion that full fiscal autonomy could leave Scotland worse off are just laughable and no one believes them. Another point in Labour's motion is the mention of Labour's redistributive policy plans. Is that really the case? Would Labour really distribute wealth and income? Now again, a few points on this. Why did the previous Labour government preside over a widening gap between the rich and the poor in society? Point two. Labour's plan is a 10% to 50% rates of, for income tax, and that on the surface sounds progressive. Not as progressive, of course, as the previous uh, Labour government, or a previous Labour government, which I remember, uh, when they took income tax rates up to 98%. But I think even they would accept that's a bit extreme nowadays. But at least 50% would appear to be a step in the right direction. But of course, we need to remember that national insurance is a factor in here as well. NIC is not progressive at all, starting at 12% and falling to 2%. So the combined rate, according to Labour, would start at 22% and the top rate would be only 52%. Can that really be described as progressive? I don't think so. Will Labour increase the 2% NIC for higher earners, including ourselves? So you can argue for or against higher rate of income tax and NIC, but I would just say today that a combined rate, top rate of 52% cannot be called progressive and 22% is still too high a hurdle for low earners. Point three, and then if we are serious about redistributing, surely we have to look at redistributing wealth and not just income. Inheritance tax is the obvious player here, although previously we have had capital transfer tax. It is very difficult for Labour to claim to be progressive or redistributive when their motion makes no mention of redistributing wealth whatsoever. So overall, it seems we would seem there is very little more redistribution under the future Labour government than we saw under the last one. Now, all of this leads me to wonder how, I'm not taking any interventions, how, to wonder how do the public view Labour? Are Labour seen as a progressive party with redistributive policies? And if not, why not? Final minute. I think we can go back to last September and the referendum. Something seems to have changed then. Rightly or wrongly, many people saw the referendum about being whether we wanted a fairer society or not. 
And clearly many richer people voted no because they did not want a fairer and more equal society in which they might lose out. But of course, on the other hand, many poorer people voted yes, not because they had some romantic idea about Scotland, not even because they necessarily thought Scotland as a whole would be better off, but because they thought that even if the cake was a little smaller, it would be shared out more fairly and more equally. I would suggest, therefore, that it was because Labour sided last September with the rich, with the status quo, with unfairness and with inequality. That is why, when Labour campaigned for, against fairness and against, inequality, against equality last September, that they are now suffering You must draw to a close, please. You can, they can wheel out fine words if they want, like progressive and redistributive. But people saw last September what Labour really meant. They were against these things, and people will not support Labour. Thank you, Graeme Pearson. To be followed by Marjorie Fraser. President, officer, thank you for giving me the opportunity to contribute this afternoon. Uh, I do believe that John Mason does any argument uh, no justice when he glosses over the facts and he spends most of his presentation this afternoon dealing with politics and parties and not, as the motion suggests, supporting Scotland's economy. There's been a lot of statistics exchanged across the benches this afternoon and at times my head spins at the prospect of the way in which the parties opposite have tried to they provide a view that Scotland and the UK generally is moving forward. And in that context, I'm loath to add any additional statistics. But I think, although alluded to by Jackie Bailey earlier, the full impact of the Wealth and Assets report yesterday was not brought to this chamber. In that asset report, it says that 10 per cent of households own 74 per cent of financial wealth in Scotland. That same 10 per cent have 55 per cent of the pension wealth. They also have 43 per cent of property wealth. Can it possibly be right in a Scotland in the 21st century that those kinds of statistics can appear on our national newspaper and we don't have a sense of social injustice? a view that we need to take steps to move forward and not mark time with good words and constant referrals to, to, to statistics which are meaningless. One statistic or set of statistics I received today, which I think adds to that a fund of knowledge, has been issued by the Business Register Employment Survey, a UK survey, which notes that many of the districts in Scotland have indeed lost jobs in the period 2009-2013. In East Renfrewshire, 3,000 jobs. Uh, sorry, East Ayrshire, 3,000 jobs. East Renfrewshire, 700 jobs. Glasgow, 24,500 jobs, and so on. These are real jobs, a real purpose in life, an opportunity to develop an, on, an economy within a family which is meaningful and gives purpose and create a distance between daily life in poverty and a future contributing to the well-being of Scotland. Much has been said about what does the Labour Party uh, contribute in moving forward. We've indicated that we believe that energy costs should be capped We've said that we would raise living standards by initially increasing the minimum wage to £8 an hour. We've introduced the idea that every young person, 18 and 19-year-old, who leaves school and goes straight into work should have £1,600 allocated in order that they can be helped with training, tools and start-up costs for business. We've indicated that we believe that we should move forward in balancing the books and introduce a mansion tax in order that we can begin to shift wealth from those who have to those who have not. And we would see uh, 24 million working people being taken uh, out of the burden of much of the tax they face by creating a 10 pen starting rate for tax. These are practical options I'm sorry, there's not sufficient time. These are practical options which will take us forward in a productive way for the future. The SNP have indicated that they would like full fiscal autonomy. 
and that presupposes that the Barnett formula will no longer be applied Fine in our minute. relationship with the United Kingdom. It was only six months ago we were told that the wealth of Scotland's oil would see us through any future that we might face. And we had an enormous confidence that that wealth would continue to flow. How time has changed, not because an SNP government have made any wrong choices, but the world, unfortunately, has impacted in decisions that we take here in Scotland, and these impacts will be long term. So there is a need to take a more productive look in the way forward. We should reject George Osborne's approach, which suggests we are all doing so well and moving forward together. Whatever the plan was, and I think the Green Party had it right, it was not to ensure that those who have not took part in our economy in the future, but the wealthy did so much better. We thank you, close. President. Thank you very much. Murdo Fraser, to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm probably going to be rather unkind to Jackie Bailey during the course of this speech, so let's start on a point of agreement. I agree with the part of the SNP, uh, of the Labour motion, rather, referring to the SNP's disastrous plans for full fiscal autonomy. Because Jackie Bailey fairly said, this would represent huge funding cuts to health, education and policing, totalling £7.6 billion, alternatively substantial tax rises, as confirmed by the Institute for Fiscal Studies. And I commend to members the excellent article in yesterday's Scotsman by Peter Jones. He concluded, this is an insane time to be pursuing such a policy. And he's absolutely right. The Scottish people would be those who suffer from such a move. Now, the SNP claim that they could grow the economy faster than even the record growth which we are predicted to see in the UK in coming years. And yet, as Peter Jones pointed out, if there was any way of managing an economy to get out of public spending austerity caused by a deficit, do you not think the governments of Greece or Ireland or Spain or Italy or Portugal would have discovered it by now? Or maybe it's just that our SNP ministers are somehow magically blessed with a talent beyond anyone else anywhere in the world. <laughs> but I see they're not leaping up to defend themselves, Deputy Presiding Officer. <laughs> but sadly, it's there that Jackie Bailey and I must part company because the rest of her motion, and I'm afraid much of her speech this afternoon, was patent nonsense. Now, so let me give Jackie Bailey some gentle advice. It's one of the rules of politics that you should play to your strengths. When choosing topics for debate, <laughs> choose the subjects where you have a strong record and where you can attack your opponents. You should avoid areas of weakness where your opponents can undermine your arguments. <laughs> On that basis, presiding officer, Labour's choice of, of, of topic for this afternoon's debate must rank high on the courageous register. For the Labour track record in the economy is one best brushed under the carpet and quietly forgotten, not one taken to the chamber and championed in a debate. Because we can all in this chamber remember the state of the economy in 2010. High unemployment, deep recession and the worst set of public finances in the developed world. That was Labour's legacy. Now, thankfully, in 2010, the people of the United Kingdom had the good sense to elect a Conservative-led government a government which took some tough decisions in the teeth of opposition from the Labour Party and others, but tough decisions now delivering real success. So since 2010, we see... Oh. Sorry, point of order, Dr Richard I Simpson. Like Could I have Dr Richard Simpson's microphone, please? Yeah. Presiding officer, I wonder if you would like to afford the speaker the opportunity of correcting the fact that he said that the economy was not in growth in 2010, but was in recession. That was actually incorrect. The growth was small, but it was there. He perhaps would like to correct it at this point. It's not a point of order, it's a debating point. Can I point out to the Chamber that points of order are better at the end of speeches rather than interrupting them? We are now very behind time in the debate. Murdo Fraser? Well, I hope Deputy President, you will give me some time back for that uh, intervention. But Mr I think... Fraser, I'm afraid I don't have the time. This is unfortunate. Um, but, so please carry on as quickly as you can. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, I think I must have imagined the recession that we suffered in the late, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, early part of the, uh, the uh, previous decade. Uh, I certainly remember it if Richard Simpson doesn't. Anyway, since then we've had an excellent track record. Order, Just, please. And despite some of the nonsense we hear from the Labour benches, 80% of the new jobs created are in full-time positions and 80% are in skilled 
occupations. And three private sector jobs have been created for every lost public sector job. And in 2014, there were some 34,725 more businesses in Scotland compared to 2010. The UK's inflation rate fell to zero in February, the lowest level since CPI records began in 1998. Final Wages minute. are rising faster than prices, helping families meet their bills. And we have the fastest growing economy in the Eurozone and are projected to have the fastest growing economy in the developed world in coming years. And here in Scotland, we are benefiting from all the hard decisions taken. The Labour Party motion refers to George Osborne's economic plan as having a detrimental impact on the UK economy. Detrimental? What's detrimental? Is it the rising employment? Is it the falling unemployment? Is it the low inflation? Is it the fast economic growth? If Labour wanted to see detrimental decisions, they need to look back at the decisions taken by Gordon Brown and Ed Bowles when they were in government. Deputy Presiding Officer, if I were Labour, I might have chosen some other topic for debate this afternoon. The simple fact is that if the people of Scotland wish to see continued economic growth, then the SNP route brings economic disaster. The Labour route drags us back to the failures of the past. It is only the Conservatives that can be trusted to keep us on the right path. Thank you, Kevin Stewart, to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I would like to see Mr Fraser uh, go to Aberdeen at this moment in time and say it's only the Conservatives that will keep the economy on the right path. Because in this week, we have seen a food bank in Aberdeen run out of food. That is absolutely disgraceful in a developed nation. And it shows the huge divide that we have between rich and poor. And if he is proud of that, if he is proud of that Conservative record, I would like him to go to Aberdeen and speak to the folks at that food bank and tell them that and see what happens. Uh, the opening line of Ms Bailey's motion today states that the Parliament rejects the UK Government's plans for further austerity and believes that George, George Osborne's economic plan is based on extreme spending cuts and regressive taxation and will have a detrimental impact on the UK economy. I agree with that part of the, emo the motion, but I wonder where the Labour Party actually stands on this matter. After all, the day after the budget, the Shadow Chancellor Ed Ball, speaking on Radio 4's Today programme, when he was asked, said that he wouldn't reverse any of the budget uh, that had been uh, done the day before. Uh, an admission that, if elected, an unfettered Labour government would do absolutely nothing to change the damaging Tory Liberal policies that are having a major impact on the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, that means, by signing up to that budget, that means that the, the Labour Party, like the coalition parties, have signed up to an additional £12 billion of cuts, despite the Chancellor's admission that there is headroom for investment in public services. This, of course, is the same Labour Party who trooped through the lobbies with the Tories and Liberals to vote uh, for the Charter of Budget Responsibility just weeks previously, which was another £30 billion pounds worth of austerity cuts over the first two years of the next Parliament. These statements by Ed Balls and the action uh, by the Labour Party at Westminster quite clearly show that although today's motion carps about Osborne's extreme spending cuts, when it comes to the crunch, Labour at Westminster have backed his austerity measures to the hilt. Jackie Bailey, in her speech, says that we can't afford another five years of Tory austerity. I would say to Jackie Bailey that we can't afford five years of Labour austerity either. It is quite clear. On you go. Jackie Bailey. Can you tell me how we can afford a £7.6 billion reduction in our budget as a result of the SNP's foolishness on full fiscal autonomy? What I would say is fiscal, full fiscal autonomy is not going to happen tomorrow. But is my colleague John, uh, is John, Mason, is John Mason rightly said... As John Mason rightly Archer, said, please. we can deal Archer. with this over the piece and not just rely on one year. And I will come back to that later on in my speech. The SNP has offered an alternative with modest increases in public spending to allow for £180 billion of spend across the UK. 
After the First Minister's speech outlining this policy, Jonathan Portis, director of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, said, this idea that further austerity is ine inevitable, desirable and necessary simply doesn't add up from an economic perspective. And in that sense, I think that Nicola Sturgeon is quite right to put these issues on the agenda. Uh, her good sense is maybe the reason why she is the only political leader to have a positive approval rating in England, Final minute. according to YouGov. Um, what I would say uh, in that final minute is that Scotland's revenues are growing. We pay more uh, in per head than any other part of the United Kingdom, bar London. We can do even better if we break free from the Westminster anchor of austerity. And that means that we can provide better for those folks, those most vulnerable people that have been affected by these austerity cuts which have hit them year on year. The only way to do that, to break that austerity anchor, is to send a phalanx of SNP MPs to London to haul up that anchor and bring some reality back to politics. Thank you very much. Can I alert the Chamber that I'm likely to have to reduce, closing, uh, reduce speeches? Order, please. Can I alert the Chamber that I am likely to have to reduce speeches to four minutes at some point over the afternoon? James Kelly to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this debate is very timely this afternoon as it comes as we're on the verge of the coming general election. And I think the different approaches being outlined by the, all the parties in this parliament, uh, I think are very informative to the voters throughout Scotland. There is no doubt uh, that what, what's in, incredible is the contrast between the words in the Tory motion and the reality of what's happening on the ground. You know, the Tories tell us about the growing economy, about uh, the numbers that are in employment, but on, the reality is that in the last five years, uh, people, are 1600, people in work are £1,600 uh, worse off. Families who are in benefit are £1,100 worse off. And Murdo Fraser tells us about 80% of jobs being skilled jobs. But 80% of jobs created in the last five years are low-paid jobs. And all this creates a situation where we have more people uh, on zero-hour contracts we have more people suffering uh, from benefit sanctions. We have more people struggling with the cost of living crisis. And that's why we find a situation where people very regrettably are queuing up at food banks in our constituency. That is the reality of the Tory approach. And that would be exacerbated by the re-election of a Tory government taking us back to a situation that we had in the 1930s. Now, what I found... Uh, astonishing about the SNP's approach to this debate is that during the course of Mr Swinney's contribution and also Mr Macdonald we heard nothing about uh, full fiscal autonomy. Uh, I mean it's astonishing. Maybe they had forgotten it. Maybe they had too much of uh, Alex Salmon's pink champagne at lunchtime. Um, but the reality of it, at least Mr Mason was honest enough to talk about it that if you are going to have if if you're going to have full fiscal autonomy it's going to result in binning the barnet formula uh, you've got 7.6 billion less than we've got currently and that's just in the first year that will grow as the years go on and what effect you need to examine what effect is that going to have in schools throughout the country that are already struggling with cuts, that are, that some that are needing uh, rebuilt and modernised. What effect is that going to have in the NHS? What effect is it going to have where our e, &E uh, departments are in crisis? What effect is that going to have when we've got 150,000 people on social housing waiting lists? What impact is it going to have in the struggle to get more of the 400,000 people in Scotland who are, on the living, who are not on the living wage, onto that living wage. What impact is it going to have as we have a growing 
elderly population, if we've got £7.6 billion pounds less in our budget. There's no point in shaking your, shaking your head about it, Mr Swinney. You never covered it. You never covered it in the whole of your speech because you're clearly embarrassed. You're embarrassed about the Order, policy. Mr Kelly, can you, you speak through the chair, please? It. In contrast that, contrast that uh, to Labour's plans, uh, where we will seek not only to, to introduce uh, fairness, but also to support economic growth. And we'll do that uh, by introducing a tax on the banker's bonus, a mansion tax on homes uh, greater than the value of £2 billion, and also introduce a top rate of tax. From the proceeds of that, Final uh, minute. we will support the creation of a thousand more nurses in the NHS to help avert the, the, the crisis in the NHS. We will create a jobs guarantee and also a living wage uh, of £8. In addition to that, we will freeze energy prices, we will give support to student bursaries and also create a £1,600 allocation to those working class kids who are not able to get to college or university. In the next six weeks, Deputy Presiding Officer, the choice, as we've seen in the Chamber, is clear. We can continue with the Tory austerity, the Tory cuts that are so damaging in our, in our communities. We can adopt the SNP approach, which would create a £7.6 billion black hole in Scotland's budget. Or we can adopt the positive redistributive policies of the Labour Party, Come which to will close, create, create economic growth and help Scotland's communities to get back on their feet again. Thank you. I now call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding, presiding Officer. Uh, the motion talks about austerity, so I wanted to start by uh, having a look at the first anti-austerity national leader, um, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, a man for whom the war on want was not rhetoric but real. Roosevelt's anti-austerity programme was the New Deal, which saved many thousands of Americans from hunger and want by investing in the infrastructure of the country and establishing a social security net for the first time. It cost him, it cost money, of course, and it made him enemies amongst the establishment. He was told it was too expensive and that the priority should be balancing the books, as Jackie Bailey has just said. Uh, indeed, in his election address at Madison Square Garden, Roosevelt noted that never before in all our history have these forces of conservatism been so united against one candidate as they stand today. They're unanimous in their hate for me and I welcome their hatred. I should like it to have it said that the forces of selfishness and lust for power have met their match. Roosevelt was told that state spending was unaffordable and that a balanced budget should take priority over feeding the hungry and rebuilding the country after the Great Depression. And it's a sad fact, presiding officer, that the arguments and forces of fiscal conservatism that were lined up against Roosevelt eight decades ago are alive and well today in the UK, ensconced for the moment at least in number 11 Downing Street, putting in place another 30 billion of cuts that will hit the poorest people in our society. And Scotland alone will, will, will see another 12 billion cumulative cut over the next four years. Now, I know that the Labour Party would very much like to pretend to have inherited Roosevelt's mantle. Their motion uses the language of anti-austerity, but he never advocated, quote, sensible cuts in public spending, which the Labour Party have supported at Westminster. No, I've only got five minutes, sorry. Anti-austerity... Um, Anti-austerity, which means investing, nourishing the economy, encouraging economic activity, as the, as the Deputy First Minister says, will increase the tax take. If you cut spending and reduce economic activity, you inhibit the income from tax and you have to borrow more as a consequence. This is the lesson that Roosevelt and Maynard Keynes taught us many, many decades ago, and it's why George Osborne's austerity has failed. It's the reason why borrowing has risen substantially beyond his initial expectation and uh, it's exceeded the June 2010 forecast by over 50 billion in 2014-15. Uh, and disgracefully, the Labour Party have signed up to this failed model. It's surely disgraceful that Ed Balls says there's nothing he would change in George Osborne's budget. George Osborne was very explicit in his budget that welfare will take the biggest hit, a hit that disproportionately hurts the disabled and families with children. In voting for the Charter of Budget Responsibility at Westminster, Labour are voting to put those £30 billion of austerity cuts in place over the next two years. 
Jackie Bailey calls it balancing the books, and I suppose it's inevitable that you use the language of the Tories when you mirror the policies of the Tories. Roosevelt was attacked for failing to balance the books, and history celebrates him for doing so. And it's in this historical context that we should view the First Minister's real anti-austerity proposals. As with the New Deal, she advocated investment to promote growth through an increase in spending of £180 billion in public services till 2019-20. And she told her audience at University College London that we could use that investment to promote infrastructure, education and innovation, which will support stronger and more sustainable growth in the future. Provi presiding officer, that proposal is one which Franklin D. Roosevelt would have endorsed. In his 1936 campaign address, he said that his anti-austerity agenda had, as I said earlier, made him the most hated politician ever amongst the powerful and wealthy. And he went on to win a landslide in 1936. The SNP's anti-austerity programme has also induced some Ten very minutes. hysterical outbursts amongst the UK establishment. They fear us, they hate us, and as Roosevelt said, I welcome their hatred because we represent hope and we offer true change and a true end to austerity if we wield power at Westminster after May the 7th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm calling Dennis Robertson, but after Dennis Robertson, I'm afraid speeches will have to be reduced to four minutes. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the people on the 7th of May have got a choice to make. They will vote for more austerity from the Tories, more austerity from the Labour Party, more austerity from the Lib Dems, or a new way from the SNP, who will be able to if in a hung parliament, be able to influence the direction of travel. Now, Nicola Sturgeon in the polls is the most, is the, is the, the person who has the highest poll rating, even in England. Even in England, presiding officer. We have another choice. Osborne, Balls, or John Swinney. John Swinney to actually put forward, put forward his plans to take Scotland forward. Because this debate in the economy here this afternoon is not just the wider general debate about what's happening within the UK. It is about what is best for Scotland. Now, from the budget, from the budget presiding officer, Scotland will be £12 billion worse off. Why? Because Labour have supported the Tories and the Lib Dems once again to ensure that there are £30 billion austerity cut. They cannot run away from that fact. That is fact. It is on the record. 30 billion more austerity, and the 12 billion from the budget will come to Scotland. That's fact, presiding officer. Now let's look. Let's Order, look who's been please. paying the price. Who's been paying the price for this remarkable, this superb uh, term of office that the Conservatives and the Lib Dems are applauding themselves about? Who's been paying the price? the most vulnerable, the poorest in our society. Look at the welfare cuts. Look at the sanctions that have been imposed by the DWP. Who stepped in to try and mitigate some of that? Well, this Scottish government stepped in to try and mitigate some of the impact of the, of the welfare uh, in, in position that the uh, government has imposed in Scotland. No one else has. No one else has. Now, we, what we have done is mitigated a lot of the cuts that are coming to Scotland. We shouldn't be have to using the money to mitigate. We should be using the money here to have a progressive um, outlook for our economy. Now, what the Scottish Government have been doing to try and ensure that our economy is prosperous and moving forward is, is putting money into the capital investments and the infrastructure within Scotland, actually having jobs, creating jobs. We've got an infrastructure programme We've got the Inver Ramsey Bridge in my own constituency. We have the Afford Academy campus in my own constituency. There's the A96 in my own constituency. There are programmes that are actually taking the economy forward. It is, it is actually assisting those in the construction industry. And we are moving forward with a very progressive plan. The plan that Mr Swinney and the First Minister have in a hung parliament is the plan that the Scots will adopt on the 7th of May. Because, as we know from the polls, Labour... Conservatives and Lib Dems are nowhere to be seen in Scotland. We will have, we will have as many SNP MPs down there influencing the direction of travel for the benefit of Scotland, because this is what this Parliament requires, to ensure that we take forward 
a plan to benefit Scotland, not to bring it back into an austerity agenda. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call Drew Smith to be followed by Mike McKenzie. can give you about four and a half minutes, Mr Smith. I am grateful to you, Presiding Officer. General elections um, are an opportunity not just to challenge those with power, but indeed ultimately um, to take the power from them. And Jackie Bailey has uh, set out Labour does have a better plan for ending Tory austerity and indeed for raising living standards, because under the Tories, uh, plans to reduce the deficit have failed. And they failed because they failed to understand that the country succeeds when working families succeed. Their legacy is one of insecure and exploitative work for ordinary people, a rising cost of living, while at the same time tax cuts for the very richest and an ongoing failure to tackle the issues of tax avoidance which are robbing public services of proper support. But the SNP's central demand for this general election is full fiscal autonomy. And I think, presiding officer, this afternoon the time has come for scrutiny of this idea of full fiscal autonomy, because Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon have been absolutely clear. This is the, uh, the SNP's stated aim for the general election. Influence in the House of Commons, such as to secure full fiscal autonomy for Scotland. Now, others have defined what that means. We all understand uh, what full fisc fiscal autonomy means. And on one level, it's a, it's a simple solution to the conundrum of where power lies uh, and in whose interest it is wielded. But the outcome of full fiscal autonomy would in fact be very simple indeed, because it would mean the devastation of Scottish public services, job losses, cuts on a scale that dwarf the other issues we are discussing this afternoon, full fiscal austerity, austerity max, cuts on top of cuts on top of cuts. It is quite simply, presiding officer, a terrible idea. That's why John Swinney didn't mention it once in his 10-minute speech. The SNP's key aim for the general election and the finance secretary will not even defend it. That's why Mr Macdonald wouldn't defend it, but we have to give credit to Mr Mason uh, for attempting to. Mr Swinney, if you wanted to talk about full fiscal autonomy, you had an opportunity in opening uh, this debate, because this is an idea that no one who cared about people who actually rely upon public services could ever conceivably support. And I've listened carefully to the arguments from the SNP this afternoon, and the truth is we have not heard a single cogent reason why this would be in Scotland's interests. Whatever our views on the merits or otherwise of independence or indeed our assessment of the coalition's record, we should all be able to agree that this is a very, very bad idea. So I am proud to argue the case for my party's better economic plan, to balance the books by growing our economy. And I'm not shy of the fact, and I have to say to SNP members who bandied, a word, uh, bandied around the word progressive this afternoon, and not one of them has mentioned taxation. That is absolutely shocking, presiding officer, because I am, I am prepared to say that in order to achieve that fair balance, it does mean asking those with the most to pay very modestly more. Labour's proposals are for redistrib redistribution, from those with most to those with least. Pooling and sharing resources, which Scotland's place in the UK, a place that we confirmed uh, last year, that, that, that union delivers. That means redistribution in different parts of the union. And you know the SNP's plan for full fiscal autonomy, that's what it would achieve. It would wreck the redistribution across the United Kingdom, and in the process, they would wreck Scotland's public finances. Fine there are minute. no arguments for this, presiding officer, other than an ideological one. Why are they uh, attempting occasionally uh, to argue it at all? It's because it's the idea that they think most, looks most like independence. That is the only argument uh, for this disastrous uh, policy that can be made. And John Mason said... Uh, 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 the, the others were, were talking Scotland down. Well, the truth is that they are arguing for this policy, whether it would make Scotland richer or poorer. And the truth is, we know it would make Scotland poorer. Why do we know that? The Scottish Government's own figures tell us that. And IFS puts the figure at £7.6 billion. So I understand, presiding officer, uh, that uh, many people have a, a deeply held belief and support for Scotland uh, being separate from the rest of the UK. And I understand that members opposite, that's an unshakable belief and they're not going to change it. I accept that the Conservatives and the Liberals will defend uh, their record. And I think Patrick Harvey is right. The Conservative members who believe in a smaller state are supportive of continuing and deepening austerity to achieve precisely 
that aim. But I'm what I cannot understand, close. Presiding Officer, the Scottish ministers who now choose to campaign for an arrangement predicated on staying in the UK, which would actually make us worse off within I'm sorry, the UK. Mr. Smith, it is I the worst no time of all worlds. And I therefore support the Labour uh, motion in front of us today and look forward very much to this general election campaign. Many thanks. I can give Mike McKenzie and Chick Brody four and a half minutes each. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. Um, it's very disappointing this afternoon to hear the Labour Party reheating these tired old arguments. We're too poor, we're too pu uh, we, we're too stupid. Next, they'll be telling us we're not genetically suited to take Order, these big decisions for ourselves. But the really disappointing thing about this afternoon's debate is that only the SNP and, to a certain extent, the Green Party have put pro forward credible proposals for an alternative economic strategy. And the Labour Party is desperately trying to create the illusion that there is any significant difference between their proposals and the Tories. And the reality is that those differences are marginal. And only a few weeks ago, they marched through the lobbies side by side with their Tory friends to vote for continuing austerity. And the reality is that all of the UK parties are wedded to austerity, with Labour claiming that their cuts are somehow nicer cuts than the Tory cuts. The people haven't spoken yet, but they're showing all the signs that they've got greater economic wisdom than their political masters in Westminster. And in a Westminster electoral system that's designed to give a clear majority to one party, it doesn't look as if any of the main UK parties enjoys much public confidence. President Officer, Scotland is now the key battleground in this UK election, and there has been much speculation about the reasons for Labour's falling fortunes in Scotland. And it's not just about the semantic shilly-shallying over what was promised in the vow. It's not just that Labour campaigned some side by side with the Tories during the referendum. It's not just about the enhanced political engagement brought about by the referendum, but it's also about an increasingly informed electorate. It's also about a large section of the population who, as a result of the referendum, have received a political and an economic education. I'm sorry, I'm short of time. It's also about the democratisation of information, aided and abetted, as we know, by the internet and shared by means of social media. Presiding officer, this, increased, in, this increasingly informed electorate know that deficit reduction is not in itself an economic plan. Mr Kelly, I said no to your intervention. It would be one of the... They know that deficit reduction is not in itself an economic plan. It would be one of the happy outcomes of a good economic plan. But it should not be the sole purpose of an economic plan. And to focus solely on deficit reduction is to attempt to treat one of the symptoms of the disease and not the disease itself. And if we're to nurse our economy back to good health, it's necessary to deal with the underlying problems of our economy. It's necessary to move from a low-wage economy to a high-wage economy. It's necessary to move from a position of low productivity to one of high productivity. President officer, I was reading last night about the financial and property crisis of the Roman Empire in AD 33. The business cycle has waxed and waned from before that time. Final minute. Gordon Brown's boast that he'd ended boom and bust was like a surfer riding on the crest of a wave, trying to claim that he created the wave. Governments can dampen down the business cycle, but they cannot end it. And good government economic policies can reshape our economy to deliver better outcomes. Increasing our productivity would increase competitiveness. Moving to a higher wage economy would increase taxation revenues and tackle the deficit far more effectively than implementing harsh cuts. Tackling inequality would deliver real and sustainable economic growth. And that's why economists like Paul Krugman and Brian Ashcroft, and I'm not always a fan of these gentlemen, are suggesting that the UK parties have a bogus economic narrative. You must draw to a close, please. So for these reasons, President Officer, it's necessary to send a large block of SNP 
MPs down to I'm afraid you must finish, and I have to deduct it from Mr. Brodie. From there. Thank you very much, Chick Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I feel that today we're in a time warp. 14 days ago, we were talking about Labour supporting the Scottish economy. Today, they're talking about supporting Scotland's economy with the same mood music, funereal. You know, last time, the lyrics were bad. Today, they're absolutely horrible. The motion calls for the rejection of the UK government plans for austerity, that it believes uh, George Osborne's economic plan is, is based on the extreme spending cuts and regressive taxation. But as Mr Osborne didn't or wouldn't spell out the extreme cuts or any menu of them, it is an incumbent. In fact, it's essential for Labour to tell us today, tell us now, when they voted for the £30 billion of austerity cuts, what was on the menu? And now I won't rehearse all of the Ed, Ball, Ed Ball's uh, Radio 4 quotes uh, last week, his non-reversal of the Osborne cuts in public spending. So if Osborne won't tell us, then Balls, on that basis, uh, appears to know what they were. So tell us, what are they? What has Labour signed up to? Tell the people what the cuts are going to be. And of course, Labour now invokes the OBR and its warning about yet further cuts and more savage yet undefined cuts eh, over the next two years. This will be the OBR that Alistair Darling, who at its inception said, and I quote, right at the, at the start, the Tories used the OBR not just as part of the, of the government, but as a wing of the Conservative Party. They succeeded in strangling a good idea at birth. This will be the OBR relied upon in the motion, who in its own fiscal outlook just a year ago, just a year ago, said that it was unable to forecast the effect of the new, uh, inverted commas, Calman taxes on the Scottish budget because, and I quote again, its forecasting methodologies are work in progress. This will be the OBR that, uh, 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 over a period of six iterations of its forecast basis, uh, provided that uh, for Osborne to produce the budget that he has just done. Then let's look at another part of the motion. The 10% starting rate of tax on the first £1,000 to save money for hard-working families. Of course, Labour doesn't or can't or won't spell out the personal tax allowances in their taxation programme. But if we just imagine, if we apply the 10 pence uh, to the first £1,000 and retain the current tax thresholds, then year on year, year on year, somewhere in £15,000 a year in 2016-17 will see a reduction of £140 in their tax bill. But someone on £50,000 a year reaps a reduction of £203 a year. So much for Labour's fairness and equality. So much for Drew Smith's crocodile tears and asking that the well-off should pay more. And, presiding officer, further in the motion to reject the sense of full fiscal autonomy and keep the Barnet formula, let's look at that. The late Lord Barnett, he of the formula, said in the event of Scotland getting more tax powers, retaining the formula would be, and I quote again, a terrible mistake. Final minute. Another Labour, lumin another Labour luminary predicted that the formula would be, I quote, diminished because the funding arrangement would be irrevocably changed by new tax powers coming to Holyrood. That luminary, of course, was Jack McConnell in August last year. So, the only true solution is, of course, to have full fiscal autonomy married to full uh, political independence. Labour have, sold, Labour have sold the jerseys. They sold the first team jerseys in 2008, and they're now selling the second team jerseys on austerity, on undefined public expenditure cuts, on spending of £100 billion on nuclear weapons, on fair work, taxation and pay. Two weeks ago, I said they had no economic strategy, no oil and gas plan, no fiscal determination, and this week they have proved it yet again. Thank you very much. We now turn to closing speeches. As ever, I expect members who have participated in this debate to be in the chamber for closing speeches. I call on Patrick Harvey, maximum six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it's quite common in these debates that I can find myself agreeing with at least half uh, of what various members who disagree vociferously with one another have to say. So maybe I'm just in an unreasonably good mood today. I'm going to focus on the stuff that I, that I do agree with, uh, at least at first. 
Uh, Jackie Bailey uh, began with a strong rejection of the coalition's record and of its promises of austerity to come. When she said there is a clear need to get rid of the Tories, that's something I uh, can very happily subscribe to. And rather than merely condemning uh, Ed Balls, let me hold out the hope that if he has the opportunity, he will find something in the last Tory budget that he'd like to overturn. I could certainly provide a list if that would be helpful. Uh, Jackie Bailey, uh, continuing her attempt to rebrand the Barnett formula as, as the Barnett bonus, launched an attack and was not the, the last Labour member to do so on the, the concept of full fiscal autonomy. L let me just try and identify one point of agreement on that. Whatever change is to be proposed in the fiscal relationship between Scotland and the rest of the UK after the implementation of what the ramshackle Smith Agreement led to, it must be subject to greater thoughtful, reflective, considered process uh, than that Smith Commission itself. We all know it was a breakneck timetable, time and those who have described it as coherent and durable find it hard to keep a straight face when they do so. So whatever comes after it must be done on a more thoughtful basis than that. Uh, Lord Smith's uh, more agreeable namesake uh, in this chamber was quite right to raise the question uh, of tax and where tax fits in this. And he's quite right to say uh, that it's absurd to argue for a more equal society without talking about the greater contribution that those who are wealthiest must be expected to pay. It's something that the Greens have argued consistently. And I certainly hope that, the, that we won't be alone in doing so in the run-up to next year's election, the Hollywood election, when all political parties are going to have to set out their stall on a more progressive tax system in Scotland. Mr Swinney, the Deputy First Minister, uh, places familiar emphasis on the approach that the SNP takes to stimulating more growth, leading to more jobs, leading to more taxes, and that is a way of balancing the books. Now, notwithstanding our old debate about the limits to growth, limits to its extent and to its value as a metric, uh, I do welcome the fact that the SNP seem to have abandoned under their new leadership the nonsense of starting that cycle with tax cuts for big business. That is an important point of change in the SNP's most recent economic policy, and I hope they follow through on that agenda further. Uh, Gavin Brown, and here I may struggle to be positive, Gavin Brown, like so many others, judges economic recovery on the basis of these incredibly narrow metrics, talking about growth regardless of who benefits from how that wealth is generated or who uh, manages to hoard it. Talking about jobs regardless of quality and security and pay levels uh, of those jobs. Talking about cuts as well only in terms of necessity as he perceives it and regardless of the human impact uh, of those cuts. And as for the Liberal Democrat position, well, Willie Rennie uh, is not the first Liberal Democrat I've heard recently uh, trying to create this, this measure of distance from the Conservatives. It's clear that the Liberal Democrats feel ready for a spell in opposition. Well, I don't think they need to worry. I feel that that burden may be lifted from them soon. Uh, the, the empty hopes of their activists, the empty sound bites and the empty yellow boxes, these will all soon be things of the past. Deputy Presiding Officer, the green proposition that we put out on Green QE is quite consistent. And I find it astonishing that such radical words can come. It's quite consistent with a paper from the Bank of England, uh, not the most radical economic voice in the land. In their recent paper, One Bank Research Agenda, climate change and policy, technological and societal responses to it could have significant effects on financial markets and financial institutions, presumably as well as crashing the life support system we depend on. It'll be bad for the markets. And so they conclude by saying central banks may have to respond to the challenges presented by these forces. Well, we have offered a means by which the central bank can do so. Investing in renewable energy, investing in energy efficiency, investing in the high quality housing that the country needs, investing perhaps in some of the IP generation in uh, offshore energy, in energy storage uh, and in uh, alternatives to petrochemicals, some of the areas where Scotland could have a leading advantage. 
and the use of the Green Investment Bank or a national investment bank to enable local authorities, devolved governments, NHS trusts and boards and other public bodies to make that investment. As with the previous QE programme, debt issued by one part of government is taken up by another part of the public sector. It ceases effectively to be debt, no interest accrues, and it opens up the possibility for that investment. Investment in the public good, investment in environmental progress, investment in high-quality jobs in every constituency of the UK. That's the kind of programme that the next UK government should be investing in. And I do hope that whoever has influence on that balanced parliament that's likely to emerge from this uh, year's election will press that point to the benefit of Scotland and the rest of the UK. Thank you. Many thanks. Before I call our next closing speaker, I note that Alec Riley has not returned to the Chamber. I don't have an explanation for that. I now call on Willie Rennie, maximum six minutes, please. In response to a point, an intervention from Jackie Bailey, Kevin Stewart, and asked about full fiscal autonomy, said, well, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Well, thank goodness for that. Because if we had listened to him last year and he had had his way in the referendum, it would be next year. And if we listen to him on May the 7th, it might be here next year. That's the price that we would pay. I'll take an intervention from Kevin Stewart if Wait. he's got some kind of explanation. Well, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I think that Mr Rennie uh, should tell the public about the deficit that is currently being run by the UK government and the huge debt, one and a half trillion pounds, that the UK has. Uh, we could grow ourselves out uh, of deficit, now which is along, something Mr. Stewart. that the UK government seems incapable of doing. Well, Other well, countries Rennie. can do it. Why not Scotland? Well, Rennie. well Kevin Stewart as Chancellor, achieving miraculous rates of growth in just 12 months in order to deal with a massive hole in the finances that he would leave. That's what he's suggesting. He says it's not going to be here tomorrow, but thank goodness that it's not. And I'm disappointed that Alex Rowley is not in the chamber because he did criticise the coalition's deficit reduction plan. But he seems to have forgotten an important thing that Alistair Darling said when he was Chancellor, Gordon Brown's Chancellor, he said that there would be tougher and deeper cuts than those implemented by Margaret Thatcher. Well, that was the case. The reason why that was the case is because of his former boss and colleague Gordon Brown and the state that he left the country in. So Alex Rowley should be a little bit more careful in criticising the coalition's plans, because that's exactly what his chancellor would have done if he had been returned to office. And Alex Rowley and Andrew Smith, in fact, also failed to recognise when they talked about the impact on working people. The big tax cuts we've had. Now, I met a man the other day who was paying... 12, he had received £12,000 of an income a year. Now, he used to pay, before the coalition came to power, £1,100 in income tax. Now, he will pay £200 in income tax. The biggest tax cut for working people I think I have ever seen and probably we will ever see in the future, not just now. So that is the kind of thing, that's the practical measure we need to implement to help working people. We had many people talking about progressive politics, but I don't think it's progressive to leave an ever-growing mountain of debt for future generations to pay. I'm not going to spend today what our, sh our children should have tomorrow. Nor, I believe, and this is the Conservatives, should we be cutting beyond today what is necessary to balance the books. I think we should invest appropriately, build that stronger economy and that fairer society so that there is opportunity for everyone. I started off by setting out the difference between the various parties on the economy. Labour and the SNP, I believe, want to borrow far too much. The Conservatives want to cut too much. Either would return us to that seesaw damaging economics of the past. And we should steer clear of advice from those parties in that regard. Many people have talked also about tax dodging. Now, I have um, a report here which sets out what the UK coalition have done on tax dodgers. We've closed many loopholes. In fact, 33 different tax loopholes. We've prosecuted 10 times more people for tax crimes than the Labour Party did when they were in power. We've clawed back a massive £1.4 billion extra from fraud by using better data. 
and £9 billion taxed back from those in Switzerland, Liechtenstein and the Channel Islands. That's practical measures that has resulted in big tax take back to the government to help us in difficult times. Now, none of the members, none of the members mentioned any of this, just like none of the members mentioned the tax cuts for those for working people. Now, I think if we're going to have a balanced debate, we should recognise that we have also in this country got the economy back on track and we've done it fairly by cutting tax for those on low and middle incomes, by making sure we're helping those from disadvantaged backgrounds with things like childcare, a massive expansion in childcare. In fact, the SNP government need to do an awful lot to catch up with the UK government on childcare. But we've also made sure that this economy is going to stay the course, because if we listen to the advice from the SNP and the Labour Party, Final we'll minute. just plunge ourselves into even higher levels of debt. And we listen to the Tories, the cuts to public services will be really deep. They'll go back to the levels that we had in the 1960s. We'll see massive cuts to public services, to the NHS, beyond what is sustainable. And I think we need to stay the course, keep that balanced approach, the balanced approach that has worked over the last five years, with 187,000 extra jobs in this country. Something, again, that no member in this chamber is going to recognise other than the Conservatives. I think we've made significant progress in the country in the last five years, based on a plan that none of these people said we'd work. None of them said we'd work. We you must draw to close, repeatedly please. from them that this plan would not work. So we should stay the course, get that balance between borrowing and spending right, keep the course on path for that fairer society and that stronger economy. Thank you. Many thanks. And now calling Gavin Brown. Maximum six minutes, Mr Brown. Presiding officer, thank you. Um, let me start by just coming back on some of the points made by the Labour Party. They first of all said that the Chancellor's plans would be detrimental and have a negative impact on the economy. But that doesn't square terribly well with the growth projections, which were revised upwards last week, along with the unemployment projections, which were revised downwards, and indeed the employment projections, which were revised upwards. With full employment, now a distinct possibility uh, perhaps by the end of the next parliament. We heard that they would do things differently, but I think they were a little light on detail. The idea of a 50p tax rate is something that obviously this side of the chamber would be against. But I ask in all seriousness, particularly with income tax being uh, devolved, how much would a 50p tax rate actually raise in Scotland? Relative to the economic damage it could do, the perception that Scotland is a difficult place to do business that it might add to. How much would a 50p tax rate actually raise? And I hope Labour uh, can return to that in their closing. They want to bring in a 10p tax rate. Fair enough. But is this then a backdoor admission that it was quite wrong of Gordon Brown in the first place to remove the 10p tax rate? It was his final act as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Why have they suddenly changed their position on that. And while they uh, try to make out that um, the coalition government uh, is fond of austerity, but a Labour government would not have had any uh, change, it, it's simply not true to say. I looked deep into the budget, and deep in the middle of the budget, it says that the consolidation, if you add tax changes and spending reductions, the total consolidation over the course of this Parliament until now has been approximately 106 billion pounds. But 70 billion out of the 106 billion was inherited by this government from the previous government. So they would have had fewer spending cuts, but they were signed up to 70 billion out of the 106 billion that actually happened. And that was before, of course, the euro crisis uh, took shape. So they may well have ended up in a not too dissimilar place. But I want to turn now to the comments made by the SNP because there are a couple of really important ones, I think, to dwell upon. And the first one is this. The stated policy of this government is full fiscal autonomy. They've put it down on paper many times and it's been reiterated by almost every SNP speaker today. The Labour motion talks about there being a £7.6 billion worth of cuts required or tax rises. They don't mention borrowing, but of course it could be done uh, by borrowing. But there are only really three ways in which it could be done. The Scottish Government have said that the figures don't stack up. That was 
John Mason. Kevin Stewart said, don't worry, it's not going to happen tomorrow anyway, um, which isn't really a retort. But the serious point is this. What is the Scottish Government's official position on the finances for full fiscal autonomy? What do they think it would be in 1617, in 1718 or 1819? Because if that is their stated policy, if that is what they're hoping to achieve, were they to get a phalanx, uh, to quote Kevin Stewart again, a phalanx of MPs, that is what they would be pushing. And I do think the public, the people of Scotland and wider society have a right to know what are the Scottish Government's projections were that to be the case. It's easy to rubbish other parties' projections, but what is their view? And that's why in our uh, amendment, in, in just a moment, that is why in our amendment we've called for them to publish Scotland's balance sheet, the outlook of public finances, in their own terms, so that we can see what do they believe the impact on the finances would be. So I'll give way to, to John Mason. John Mason. I thank Gavin Brown for giving way. Would you accept that the Scottish Government, no Scottish Government, is going to ask for more powers which would leave them worse off? Gavin well, Brown. Well, well, OK. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where to begin to tackle that, given that John Mason and every other SNP speaker and every time the First Minister and Deputy First Minister speaks on the subject, full fiscal autonomy is their stated policy or aim. So let's I have a proposal to make, Deputy Presiding Officer, that we didn't put in the amendment, but I hope Alec Neil, who I believe is closing, will address this. Given that we have an independent Scottish fiscal commission with economic brains in there, with the ability and capacity to do the work, why don't we get the Scottish Fiscal Commission to look at the issue? Why don't we get the Scottish Fiscal Commission to publish a report on full fiscal autonomy, using all the statistics that they can get their hands upon to work out to the best of their ability what their projections would be Final minute. for 1617, for 1718, and for the members in his final minute. I think that would be fair because it's not coming from the Labour Party or the Conservative Party. It's not coming from the Scottish National Party. It's coming from the Scottish Government's own fiscal commission. And I hope Mr Neil can address that. And it's something that I think would shed some light on what is a really important issue. Then we can see whose figures stack up. Then we can see what the impacts would be. And it was then up to the electorate to judge to the best of their ability who is correct on this issue. So I simply close by saying to Alec Neil and to John Swinney, why don't we get the Scottish Fiscal Commission to look at this and publish an independent report on the matter? Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Alec Neil. Cabinet Secretary, maximum eight minutes, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by saying that uh, I've listened to all the speeches very carefully indeed, not least those in the Labour benches, and it's a great tragedy that Alec Rowley is not the main economic spokesman for the Labour Party instead of Jackie Bailey, because he showed much more sense, both in terms of his tone and the very serious issues that he raised, and quite frankly, uh, much less illiteracy in economic matters than Jackie Bailey has displayed. And the first lesson that Alec Rowley demonstrated, which I think is a fundamental issue, and it's one that Harold Macmillan, when Lord Stockton uh, made a speech about in the House of Lords in the early 80s during the Thatcher recession then, and that was a fundamental one. There are two basic strategies when you have a structural deficit. You either grow your way out of the deficit or you try to cut your way out of the deficit. We have seen in recent years that trying to cut your way out of the deficit delays the time by which you can pay, get the deficit down and it also does it at enormous economic cost to your people. The estimate by Oxford University, Professor Simon Wren Lewis, is that the cost of trying to cut our way out of the deficit has been a loss of 5% of GDP across the United Kingdom, equivalent to £1,500 for every person in our country. And there are two very good, not just now, there are two very, very practical good examples that prove the point. Because if you compare what has happened in the UK with what has happened under President Obama in the States, his strategy was to grow his way out of the deficit, and he now has a much, much lower deficit than either the UK 
or indeed many other countries. Indeed, the UK's deficit as a percentage of GDP is one of, if not the highest, in the whole of Europe. So the idea that you can cut your way out of the deficit is absolutely the wrong way to do it and a very costly way. But there's actually a very good example closer. To, I will in a minute. I will in a minute. There's another very good example closer to home. Because the strategy that has been followed, recommended by the World Bank, is that you, the two things you can do to bring the deficit down quicker as a part of your growth strategy is, first of all, to invest in capital. Capital investment creates far more jobs than any other way of creating jobs. That means far more revenue, far more savings in Social Security, and a much bigger reduction in the deficit. And the other way is not to cut welfare, but actually, as the World Bank has now shown, one of the ways in which you can boost the growth of a country is by redistributive policies. And if we had pursued, at a UK level, redistributive policies, along with an investment plan Order, over the last five years, the deficit would already be much lower. The level of employment and the quality of employment would be much higher, and our overall economy would be in a far stronger position. Gavin Brown. Presenting officer, the French followed the economics of Alec Neil. They have double the level of unemployment that we have, and they have a fraction of the growth prospects this year and indeed last year. Why is that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, they didn't follow that strategy. They didn't have an investment-led uh, growth strategy, and actually they didn't pursue the World Bank suggestion about the way to do it. But you just need to look closer to home. If you look at the strategy John Swinney has followed in recent years, where we have put a massive emphasis on the importance of investment, shifting revenue spend to capital spend, and at the same time, as a result of the SFT, which you guys all opposed, we have had about £300 million a year on average more capital investment than would have been the case without the Scottish Futures Trust. As a result of that, if you look at, I will in a minute, if you look at the employment figures in Scotland, in Scotland, of all the countries that make up the United Kingdom, we have the highest level of employment and we have the second lowest level of economic inactivity. That is a direct result of the policies and the strategy pursued by this government and by John Swinney in achieving that. Lewis MacDonald. I'm grateful to Mr Neil for taking an intervention. Can he tell us when he talks about redistribution, is he referring only to shifting spending from revenue to capital or is there any measure of social redistribution policy that he would support? Alec this, government, this government, against the opposition very often of the Labour Party, has pursued very much more progressive policies than the Labour Party. I mean, you just need to look at yesterday and today's papers. The Labour Party pays lip service to redistribution and and there we have one of their biggest councils in Scotland, North Lanarkshire Council, having to be forced into position by the courts of giving equal pay to women, which they've fought for the last 10 years. So we won't be taking any lessons from the Labour Party on redistribution. The, the millions spent on lawyers' fees Order, to please. do in the chances of women getting equal pay is an upper, utter disgrace. And you'll notice none of them Order. are getting up on their feet to defend it. And indeed, if you look at the policies of the Labour Party presiding officer, earlier on we had a statement on Longanet. What is the root cause of the challenges facing Long Gannett? And this is part of economic policy. It is the tariff structure that was introduced by Ed Miliband when he was the Secretary of State for Energy. And it's that tariff structure that has done so much damage and brought forward the closure unnecessarily of Long Gannett. And also, if you listen to the Labour Party, they're facing... I will in a minute... They'll get more faces than Big Ben when it comes to economic policy. On the one hand, they're trying to say they're pursuing an anti-austerity policy and strategy. On the other, they vote for £30 billion worth of cuts. And then, after the Tory budget, Ed Balls tells Order. us there's nothing in a Tory budget that he would reverse. 
I'll give way. Chief I'm, Smith. I'm grateful to, to Mr Neil because in his uh, round of issues from Long Annet to equal pay in North Lanarkshire Council, could he perhaps address the issue that Mr Swinney singularly failed to, the, the SNP's proposal for full fiscal autonomy at this general election? Cabinet Secretary, Absolutely. and you're approaching your last minute. Well, let me just give you one example of if we are in charge of our own money. Let me just give you one example of how over the next few years Order, we, please. We, must we hear the cabinet secretary's last minute. pounds to redirect to good social and economic causes, but that would be by scrapping the plan to have a successor to Trident on the Clyde. <laughs> That's an example. That's an example of how you use your fiscal independence, not just for the benefit of your economy and employment, but actually to achieve a much fairer society. And it's a disgrace that when the Labour Party is supporting 30 billions of new cuts, Audrey, the one cut they're not supporting is cutting the 100 billion that a new trident would cost. And the Labour Party of all parties is going to waste money on that. That's what please, fiscal Cabinet independence Secretary. gives you the chance to do. And that's what we need to build up Scotland and the Scottish economy for the future. Many thanks. I now call in Lewis MacDonald to wind up the debate. Mr MacDonald, you have until 5.30pm. Uh, Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The next six weeks are about making choices. And this debate has made some of the choices clearer, although perhaps not all. The Conservative amendment highlighted the OBR's uh, revised forecast for economic growth, but didn't uh, refer to the uh, sharp squeeze on real spending in the next two years, which the OBR was predicting only last week. Willie Rennie criticised his party's coalition partners for the Conservatives' ideological drive to reduce the size of the state, as if that was something that his party hadn't noticed before now, uh, even though they've been part of such a coalition government, cutting the size of the state for the last five years. Patrick Harvey talked about green investment and I hope his party will support Labour's plans to broaden the base of the Green Investment Bank by encouraging uh, green investment premium bonds to be issued. Mr Harvey. Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Macdonald for giving way. If Mr Blanchflower is right and the next UK government is going to have to contemplate a new round of QE, Will the Labour Party be open to the idea that that investment goes into the real economy, into green investment, rather than into the financial services sector, as the last round did? I, I am Lucy certainly Donald. confident the next Labour government will want to ensure that any such economic measures are taken forward in a way that does boost the real economy and does it in a way that's sustainable as well. But what we've heard today as well from the SNP is that they maintain that they are opposed to further cuts and in favour of increased public investment, yet at the same stand time they stand for full fiscal autonomy, which would inevitably reduce the revenues available for investment and make cuts all the more certain. The Tories would shrink the state by drastic cuts in services and by regressive taxation. The SNP would divide the country by reducing to a minimum the services and the taxes we share across this island. As Jackie Bailey made very clear, Labour rejects both those courses of action, just as we reject the ideologies which lie behind them. The best way to balance budgets and reduce the level of debt is to grow the economy and the living standards of working people. And the best way to secure the benefits of growth for Scotland is to maintain the fiscal unit, union and the Barnett formula. It is simply wrong to say that there is only one way to get the current budget into balance and to start to reduce the national debt. Mr Brown and Mr Fraser claim that it can be done only by drastic spending cuts. And the SNP echo that because they want to pretend that any party committing to deficit reduction is also committing to Tory cuts. None of that is true. The Charter for Fiscal Responsibility does not say what measures need to be taken in order to balance the books. Voting for a balanced budget and voting for Tory cuts are very different things. And the SNP repeatedly saying otherwise does not make it true. It was striking that Joan McAlpine criticised Jackie Bailey for using the language of balanced budgets, which is precisely the language that John Swinney likes to use on his own front bench. How quickly the deficit can begin to go down will depend on the state of the economy and on levels of productivity. And the sooner that the next UK government can achieve improved living standards and higher productivity, the sooner it can begin to cut the debt. So Labour's approach is to use all the tools available to government to strengthen the economy in ways that benefit both the individual citizen and the public finances. 
That means using the tax system so that a greater share of the cost of strengthening the economy is borne by those who can afford to pay more. Reversing the cut to the top rate of tax for those on the highest incomes. A mansion tax on the biggest homes to fund investment in the NHS. And just as the incoming Labour government 18 years ago taxed the windfall profits of the privatised utilities to provide a new deal for the long-term unemployed, so this year's incoming Labour government will put a tax on bankers' bonuses to fund starter jobs for young people who have been out of work for a year or more. It is fundamental to Labour's view of the world, to Labour values, that social justice and economic success should go together, and that is what an incoming Labour government will seek to achieve. So as well as increasing taxes for those who can afford to pay, Labour will reduce the disadvantages of those who have lost the most in the last five years. A national minimum wage of £8 an hour using the tax system, again, to reward private companies which sign up to paying a living wage, as the best have done already, and ensuring that workers on regular hours have regular contracts by ending exploitative zero-hour contracts. Mark MacDonald. I thank the member for giving way. Of course, one way to reduce the amount of money that is spent on benefit expenditure is to remove people from the situation of relying on in-work benefits. Does the member share my concern that a minimum wage of £8 in the year 2020 will not move people significantly out of that position of in-work poverty and the need to rely on in-work benefits? Well, it, it will. But perhaps it's not enough on its own, and that's why we want to see action on the living wage as well and using the tax system to reward that. It's only a shame that Mr Macdonald and his colleagues voted five times against some of the measures we brought forward in that area. What is good for working people is good for the whole country. That is a fundamental truth to which government must return. It is fundamental, too, to the approach of Scottish Labour that we seek to promote further devolution in the context of the Smith Agreement while continuing to pool and share resources across the United Kingdom. A Labour government will bring forward a bill to implement the Smith Agreement in its first 100 days. We want to see the powers of this Parliament strengthened, but we also want to see the sharing of power across all levels of government entrenched both in our political structures and our political culture. For those of us who have supported devolution within the United Kingdom, the rational response to the Smith Agreement is to put it in place as soon as possible and then for both parliaments and both governments to do whatever they can to make it work. Now, of course, we understand that will not happen in the next few weeks. Full fiscal autonomy will be the platform of the SNP at the next election and no doubt what they will seek to pursue thereafter. It's always illuminating, and I listened with interest to the government's closing speech today because it's always a new illuminating to compare and contrast the speaking styles of Mr Swinney uh, and Mr O'Neill. Mr Swinney seeks to stay calm and measured, and he often succeeds, except perhaps when he's being criticised for what he's not said uh, and complains from a sedentary position. Mr Neil prefers to put on a more theatrical performance, and he hardly ever fails uh, to achieve that. But, but, of course, when Mr Neil is asked to close a debate, there's always a suspicion that there may be some important issue that the Scottish Government does not wish to be rationally addressed. <laughs> that was, I think, confirmed by Mr Neil's performance. And Mr Swinney gave the game away, not by what he said, but by what he failed to say. In ten minutes, he managed to say nothing uh, substantial at all about his own party's actual economic policy, which is full fiscal autonomy. Instead, he left that uh, defence of full fiscal autonomy uh, to some of those behind him. And I give way to Dennis Mr Robertson. Robertson. I thank the member very much for the brief intervention. Mr Macdonald um, is saying that they uh, criticising what we haven't said. Mr Macdonald hasn't said what his view is on Trident and what the spending would be from the Labour regarding Trident. Lewis Macdonald. I, 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 I look forward to debating defence issues with Mr Robertson. Clearly, it's not only Alec Neil. Clearly, clearly... Clearly, Alec Neil is not Order. the only one on the, on the SNP benches who somehow imagine that full fiscal autonomy uh, involves uh, decision-making power over the defence of the United Kingdom. It's no wonder that Alec Neil did not want to address the issue of full fiscal autonomy uh, when he was asked about it. The only thing he could think of uh, was a defence issue, uh, namely Trident. And, of course, when Mr uh, Swinney left defence of full fiscal autonomy uh, to those behind him, he gave us some insights into what the SNP really think. Ms. John Mason uh, made a sincere but a bizarre defence of full fiscal autonomy, which seemed to consist only of protesting that his party wouldn't want to do anything that damaged the Scottish economy, therefore its policy must be all right after all. 
Chick Brody, I think, went further than anybody. He quoted Lord Barnett, saying that keeping the Barnett formula alongside the Smith Agreement would be a terrible mistake, and he made it clear that he agreed with that uh, too. And of course, Kevin Stewart's defence was that full. The members oh, in his last four, no, sorry, the members in his last 45 seconds, Mr. Macdonald. <clears throat> Thank you for signing off. So Kevin Stewart's defence, of course, was that full fiscal autonomy wasn't really a problem because it wasn't going to happen tomorrow. Well, the question has to be, do the SNP front bench envisage it happening at all? Because there is clearly a cost to going down the road of full fiscal autonomy, and the Scottish Government need to tell us what that cost is if people, if voters in Scotland, are to make an informed choice in the next few weeks. The right choice is for a Labour government which recognises that what is good for working people is good for the economy, rejecting another five years of Tory austerity and rejecting the extra austerity of full fiscal autonomy. That is the right choice for Scotland. That is the right choice for the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate on supporting Scotland's economy. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12787. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting up a business programme, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12787. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. If I now put the question to the Chamber, the question is that motion number 12787, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12784 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a stage two timetable for the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12784. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion so I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12784 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 12788. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage one timetable for the Care of Scotland Bill, any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12788. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12788, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureaus. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 12785 and 12786 on approval of SSIs. Moved on block. The questions on these motions will put a decision time to which we now come. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12776.4 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the voter amendment number 12776.4 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 48. There were four abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. Can I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Gavin Brown is agreed, the amendments in the name of Willie Rennie and Patrick Harvey fall. The next question then is amendment number 12776.3 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 12776.3 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 99. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12776.1 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting Scotland's economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members to cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12776.1 in the name of Willie Rennie is as follows. Yes, four. No, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that amendment number 12776.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey, on supporting Scotland's economy, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members, you can answer votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12776.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey is as follows. Yes, 5. No, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey as amended on supporting Scotland's economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12776 in the name of Jackie Bailey is amended is as follows. Yes, 62. No, 47. There were four abstentions, so the motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next, motion is at number, the next question is at motion number 12785 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval for SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12786, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.